YouTube recording now. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen with you so that we can go through the PowerPoint. Um, any questions? No? Looking to see if people are typing. Um, okay, what am I doing? I'm sharing a screen. I need to drink more coffee. Oh, we're back to our pretty Picasso. Uh, sharing my PowerPoint. It's taking me a minute here. All right, everybody see the, um, the PowerPoint? Looks like it's up. If you are having trouble with your view of the, if, if it's blurry um, or you can't see the picture very well, the YouTube recording is recording off of my computer and it is very clear. So the YouTube recording will not be what you're seeing on your screen. It will be very clear. Um, Switching to Chrome helps. That's interesting. I didn't hmm, wonder why. Guess Chrome's just better able to handle um, media. I don't know. All right. So um, basically, what the the respiratory refresher? I'm blowing through. Um, not going to spend a lot of time refreshing respiratory on you. That's on you to kind of make sure that you're comfortable with respiratory before we get into the complex concepts of the ARDS and the effusions and the chest tubes. So, um, you know, here we are, you know all this. Um, I'm going to spend a second on this slide to point out just a few things um, to you here. Because when we talk about effusions and um, ARDS, I'm going to be discussing a couple of concepts. And I want to just remind you of where everything is. So everything that we are, um, most of the things that we worry about are at this alveolar capillary membrane. You can see that the capillary is one cell thick. It's really teeny tiny. Um, when this backs up and there is a ton of pressure in the capillary, you can see that it's very easy to diffuse across into the alveoli. So if this gets full and distended with blood, um, like it does when we have heart backup and we have um, tons of fluid in there, things diffuse across the capillary membrane very easily. The capillary membrane is only two cells thick. Um, it is easily um, crossed, and so that's why we end up having a lot of fluid um, getting into our lungs. This should be air only, the, the alveoli should be air only, and this is blood only. When we have differences in the diffusions, we have problems. We also have issues with um, damage to this membrane. Um, if this membrane is damaged, then, or thick, or scarred, then nothing can cross it, including oxygen and carbon dioxide. So some of our issues are with this um, membrane, okay? So when we talk about ARDS and when we talk about what's happening with COVID patients, um, what we're having problems with is the actual membrane. Not so much there's nothing you know wrong with our airways. The problem is is that our membrane is getting damaged here and we are unable to cross fluid, we're unable to cross um, oxygen and carbon dioxide across the membrane. If that happens in enough alveoli, we end up having um, big time oxygenation issues. So if you ever need a visual, go back to this slide. It's one of uh, my favorites. Um, so let's keep going through. Um, hang on, those guys. So the other place that we're talking about is outside the capillaries, I mean outside the alveoli, and we're looking at the pleural membrane. So the pink part of our lungs is all of those alveoli with capillaries outside them. So basically the, al the alveoli are the air sacs, and then all around that is the capillaries. 
Um, so the pink part of our lungs is the alveoli. So what's on the outside, so if we go back to this, what's on the outside is the, um, man, is the, um, excuse, I'm going to draw again. This right here is the pink part of our lungs that we're seeing when we look into the lungs. This is the pink part of the alveoli that we're seeing there. And then um, on the outside of this is the pleural membrane. Oh, I can't spell. Just ignore that. So this right here is another membrane that is known as the pleural membrane. What is in between here? Anyone? What is in between the pink alveoli and the pleural membrane? Pleural fluid. Very good. It's like you read the book. Um, there is very little bit of pleural fluid, and this is um, kind of like lube, basically, so that as those veoli expand and contract, they don't... Um, it doesn't damage this membrane. If this membrane was rubbing up against something all the time, then it would get damaged. So um, basically this pleural fluid sits there. It's very small amount of fluid. It is just like a thin um, Vaseline layer that prevents rubbing up against this pleural membrane. And the pleural membrane is what is protecting the lungs from the rest of the thoracic cavity. But you can see though that um, between the capillaries there and the alveoli, we have three cells worth of thickness. And if fluid is escaping into the alveoli because it's under high pressure, guess where else it's going to escape? It's gonna to go to the path of least resistance here. And so let's make this a big swollen blood vessel here. And let's say it's big and swollen and it's leaking fluid into the alveoli, well, it's also probably leaking fluid into the pleural space. So when we're looking at this, when we're looking at an issue here, um, we can see leaking both ways. There is leakage into the alveoli and leakage into the pleural space. Um, I'm going to clear all this for a second and redraw it. The other issue we have, so with fluid overload, you can end up with um, fluid in your lungs, which makes crackles and rails, and you can have fluid in your pleural space, which shows up on the x-ray as a pleural effusion. So when we go through these pleural effusions, I may bring this picture back to you. The other problem we have, so this is the um, pleural membrane. My great um, drawing there. This is the pleural membrane with a little bit of pleural fluid. For lubrication. Um, let's say that you get an infection here and then bacteria are um, now damaging these cells. Well, the cells will bring white blood cells in there to fight the bacteria and will bring an inflammation reaction to this area of bacteria. Inflammation makes cell walls leaky so that white blood cells can get out and white blood cells leak into here and into here. So we can not only have um, fluid leaking out, we can have um, immu uh, an inflammatory response leaking out. Because remember, if you bang your finger and damage your finger, it's going to swell. And if we damage the lung with a bacteria, like a pneumonia, well, now this inflammation swelling is going to go both ways, into your alveoli and into your pleural space. Does that make sense to people? So what is happening here on a small level is if you have a small infection, you probably have small, teeny, tiny pleural effusions all the time that get cleaned up. And this pleural fluid um, circulates around and goes back into your lymph system. Um, we are probably always breaking little pieces of our alveoli and those cell membranes are delicate. We're always having probably little microscopic pleural effusions, but when they start ending up big parts of the lungs, we have big problems. So that's kind of what this picture is showing here. 
um, is it is showing that there is that pleural cavity containing pleural fluid there, and that is what we worry about when um, things start to leak. Um, so again, I'm not going over respiratory assessment. You should know that. If you do not know these slides, please go back and look at them. Um, one of them is care of the patient. That um, What time did class start? Nine o'clock, Tori. Um, bronchoscopy, but it is recording. Um, bronchoscopy, one of the things on your class preps was care of the patient post bronchoscopy. So this is one of the things that we can do to go in and look at the lungs to figure out um, what we are doing um, and visualize your airways. You can only go down um, so far. You can't go into the alveoli with a bronchoscope. Um, but if you do have a bronchoscopy, I don't know if you covered this in block two, um, but I did want to point out care of the patient post bronchoscopy. Um, and those are your three most common complications post bronchoscopy. Um, I would want you to be able to watch for those if your patient had a bronchoscopy. So I am going to point out that slide for you um, and those top three things to look for post bronchoscopy. Um, I'm really not going to go over oxygen delivery again. Um, this should have been block two, but I know that um, there were some concerns when we were doing SIM that um, maybe this wasn't 100% clear. So I, uh, I did put down all the different kinds of oxygen delivery devices and what they deliver, not testing you on it, but if I tell you they're on high flow nasal cannula, um, I would like you to know that that is probably one of the top, um, you know, that's a pretty high flow. There's a lot of oxygen coming out of that. Um, that's pretty high support. Um, so let's see. Um, these are all the lung diseases that are reviewed in here. The ones that I'm going to test you on are the ones that are highlighted. Um, ARDS, uh, fusion, empyemas, pneumothorax, and hemothorax. Um, the rest of them are reviews that you should have had in block two, but again, I'm putting this up here just for, you know, NCLEX review, review. So I'm going to scroll through all these because these all should be review. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip through all this um, because again, review, review, um, review. So let's start into, we have issues with our alveoli here. And um, anytime you have fluid in your alveoli space, it's called pulmonary edema, okay? Pulmonary edema is fluid in the alveoli space. Um, we were talking about how when this area gets full um, with lung infection or light, right, left or any kind of left-sided heart failure, when you have left-sided heart failure, these capillaries get full and distended tons of blood tons of blood starts to leak across and gets filled with fluid um, when it gets filled with fluid um, oxygen can't get in so the oxygen has to turn around and go back out co2 stays in the bloodstream and then the alveoli collapse because it's air that keeps it full so these alveoli start to collapse, and then any leaking is now leaking into this dead space here between the alveoli and the capillary. And then we end up with not only fluid in the alveoli, we have fluid in this dead space around the alveoli. So pulmonary edema is when we have fluid here. Pleural effusion, when I talk about that, is going to be when we have fluid out here on the other side of the capillary. But we're talking about pulmonary edema here, and we've got pulmonary edema when we have fluid in the capillary or in the dead, I mean in the alveoli, or fluid around the dead space around the alveoli. And our big one is going to be um, ARDS that we're gonna talk about, but um, lung infection can do this because your capillaries are leaky when you have a bacteria and you can leak fluid into your alveoli in your dead space and left-sided heart failure because there's so much fluid in this um, capillary that it leaks out into the passive least resistance and goes into the alveoli. Um, so that is just our picture again. So what are we going to hear if we have 
fluid in our alveoli. Um, you will have diminished lung sounds, no airflow, or crackles in the affected area. Crackles is the sound of oxygen and gases trying to bubble through that. Um, you can also have diminished breath sounds because air can't get through fluid. Um, so you can have diminished lung sounds, crackles, you can have rails. Rails mean there's a lot of fluid. You're hearing a lot of bubbling going on. Um, it's just louder crackles, really. Um, so you're going to hear wet lung sounds if you have alveoli disease. You're going to have dyspnea and shortness of breath because you're not exchanging oxygen. The dyspnea and shortness of breath gets more and more the more lung that is involved. So if you only have um, a quarter of one lobe that has alveoli disease, your shortness of breath is not going to be as bad as if you have an entire lobe that is full of fluid. Um, the cough could be dry, could be productive, depends on whether you're getting that fluid out. Um, and why would you be tachypnic or having a hard time? Or why would you have an increased respiratory rate? Anyone? While you're trying to breathe, you're trying to oxygenate. Um, yes, it's the high CO2 that's giving you the um, tachypnea because the air, the oxygen is not getting through the fluid. The CO2 is continuing to circulate around your body. And the high CO2 is a signal for you to breathe faster, to try to get rid of that CO2. And um, yeah, your body's trying to compensate, but it can't do it because you have fluid in your alveoli. But the tachypnea comes from the higher CO2 levels in our body, um, trying to tell us, hey, breathe faster, work harder. Um, as the things get worse or more of the lung gets involved or the amount of fluid leaking gets worse, we start to hear, like I said, the rails, they're worsening crackles. Um, now you are coughing up pink frothy sputum. And the reason if you were dry or productive before, you're just coughing up maybe mucus or whatever, but now you're starting to cough up actual thin, um, frothy liquid. You're coughing up the liquid from your alveoli. And if there was enough leaking of this capillary membrane, we could even get red blood cells into the alveoli. Normally that would not happen unless the leak is very, very bad or the pressure is so high in that capillary that now it's pushing red blood cells across that membrane. And so pink frothy sputum is definitely a worsening sign. And that means there are red blood cells in our, um, in our alveoli, which they are not normally there. Um, Cyanosis, of course, oxygen, if it can't get in through multiple alveoli, you breathe in and all of its ends are dead ends, you're going to end up cyanotic, meaning you're not having enough oxygen in your body, high blood CO2, low blood O2, and then you are, the body still asking for your respiratory system to breathe harder and faster, and you start bringing in more muscles to do the work of the lungs. Your, your lung muscles get exhausted with the tachypnea or trying to compensate when it can't. So those are why we see the cues that we see. Um, of course, if it's just pulmonary edema due to heart failure, pulmonary edema due to um, a small little pneumonia, it can be managed with um, mucolytics, which will help open up the airways to get more oxygen to areas that can take it. Diuretics, because that will help us get rid of some fluid and dry out the vascular system, so fluid will be pulled into the capillaries and then expelled. So diuretics and antibiotics, because guess what grows in dark, warm, wet places? You know that. You're just waiting for bacteria. Exactly. So as soon as we have pulmonary edema, I don't care if it's from um, heart failure or it's from an infection. You don't have to have a physical infection to get an antibiotic for pulmonary edema because we know that any bacteria that get in that system are going to just love bathing in that pool of alveoli that is full of fluid. So they will probably get either prophylactic or treatable antibiotics if you have pulmonary edema. Um, the best thing you can do as a nurse is to, of course, get them their meds that they need, but also to help them clear this fluid out of the lungs. 
um, open their airways, get those secretions moving, um, frequent coughing, deep breathing, incentive spirometer, suction them, please, if they can't cough adequately, get those secretions out of there. Yes, please, chest PT. Um, pat on their back um, and keep them hydrated. Keep secretions loose. If we have something going on in that lung and you get an infection, guess what's going to happen? Even if you didn't have an infection beforehand, now you've got bacteria in your alveoli. Now those capillaries are leaking even more to send white blood cells to the spot, and we're ending up with a huge inflammation um, going on. So clear these secretions to prevent further complications. It may not clear your initial pulmonary edema, but it will keep secretions moving, keep things clearing so that we don't get worse. Um, try to avoid any infections. We already know that any bacteria that find their way into the lungs are going to grow beautifully in there. Um, and so we're going to give the meds and keep them moving. That's the best we can do with any lung disorder at all, is give them the meds for that disorder and open their airways and mobilize secretions. Um, I'm not going through pulmonary fibrosis and sarcoidosis, but do you see how we kind of talked about pulmonary edema that was fluid in the alveoli. This alveolar membrane disease is an actual disease of the membrane that um, we it actually damages the membrane. So ARDS falls into both of these because ARDS, you see, was in alveoli disease, and ARDS is also in a membrane disease. Because what ARDS is, is adult respiratory distress syndrome. What happens is the membrane gets damaged, causing pulmonary edema. So ARDS isn't happening so much um, because we have fluid in there. ARDS usually happens because we are damaging the membrane, and then um, that leads to pulmonary edema. So let's talk about ARDS. Um, you can get ARDS from any lung injury. You can get ARDS from any major illness. Um, this is basically an immune response that damages the capillary membrane. So the capillary membrane becomes damaged and stiff. So you would think, where's the fluid coming from? If the membrane is damaged and stiff, how does the fluid get through there? Well, this damaged membrane, as it becomes damaged and stiff, first you stop oxygenating because nothing can get through this stiff membrane. So maybe your alveoli are completely open. So let's take this picture at the bottom here. And in the first stage of ARDS, the um, membranes are getting damaged here. And they're getting thick and stiff. There's no fluid in them yet. But this membrane now does not exchange oxygen and CO2. So oxygen comes in, can't get across, tries to get across, and then goes back out. The capillaries that are running alongside it can't exchange their CO2. So what happens, there's no fluid in here causing the problem, but it's the same symptoms, except that the lung sounds are not wet yet. The first signs and symptoms of ARDS or this lung damage is the fact that you have high CO2 and low O2 in your blood because nothing's exchanging. Um, what do you think you would see on your patient if they have low CO2, I mean low O2 and high CO2? What would your patient look like? You listen to their lung sounds, and they sound great. Exactly. Tachycardia and tachypnea. Somebody read ahead. Um, tachycardia and tachypnea is what your patient's going to look like. Um, somebody's phone just unpopped or popped up. There you go. Thank you. Um, so you're going to have tachycardia and tachypnea. Now, very soon after this membrane is damaged, then it starts to leak. Once it damages, it gets so stiff and damaged that it breaks. And once this membrane breaks, stuff starts flooding in 
to the alveoli, and then you end up with pulmonary edema. But the first signs and symptoms of ARDS, um, we don't usually catch or see because there's no way to really see a damaged thick membrane other than getting um, then your tachycardia and tachypnea, and then hoping to get labs. You can see the causes of this are any systemic inflammatory response, um, and really that's what's damaging these alveoli is the initial inflammatory response, a whole body-wide inflammatory response. Um, severe infections where you do have bacteria and damage to the alveolar membrane can cause ARDS. Um, trauma to the lungs can cause ARDS. Um, but what happens first is the, da the membrane gets damaged and then we end up leaking through these widespread damaged membranes. So here is another picture. I like to draw my pictures. But here's another picture of what is going on here. The membrane is completely damaged. Um, nothing is getting through, and then it becomes leaky. So you have this big picture here and all the different phases. I don't care that you know the phases. I just want you to know the early stages, because the membrane is damaged, is just tachycardia and tachypnea, then later stages is fluid-filled. Um, so that's why, for those of us that read ahead, tachycardia and tachypnea are our first signs maybe some fine crackles early as fluid starts to leak through, um, and trouble breathing. And this ARDS is exactly what is happening to COVID patients that are getting sick and getting intubated. This ARDS is what is going on with their lungs. Um, so what happens with ARDS and why it happens in some and not others is um, that... We are, um, we don't know what is happening, but what we think happens is that either the COVID virus itself latches onto the um, capillary membrane and damages it, um, or the COVID virus creates an immune response that then goes to damage the capillary membranes. But it doesn't happen in every single person that gets the virus. It is really uniquely, probably genetically triggered by um, your immune system that the COVID virus somehow either latches on to your lungs because you just have lungs that are attractive to the certain virus um, and or that the virus itself causes this inflammatory immune response that then leads to the ARDS. So the COVID patient has both bacteria and virus. Um, the COVID patient starts out with just the virus, just the virus. And so let me go back to the screen. So let's just say that instead of these little H's um, that are on phase two, this is your COVID virus. The COVID virus is latching onto this um, membrane here and causing damage to the membrane. Um, once the COVID virus damages the membrane, then fluid starts to leak through the damaged membrane and now it's a beautiful, warm, wet environment for bacteria to grow in. So COVID patients start out viral only, but then can get bacterial infections in this wet, warm space. Um, especially, we have bacteria roaming around our body all the time. Um, it's just that when they grow out of control beyond the immune system, that we call them opportunistic infections. So yes, COVID patients are starting out with um, the virus either, and they're not sure yet what is going on, um, latches on to the actual pulmonary membrane, or it is causing a systemic inflammatory response that damages the membrane. Um, because we can see one of the causes of ARDS was this systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So they're not really sure what COVID is doing here, but the end being is that if you get the lucky card that this COVID virus can attach here, or the COVID virus um, could, um, you know, cause this inflammatory response based on your genetics. Um, if you draw that lucky card, then this is what's going, this is what happens, and this is what is causing um, the death. Prophylactic antibiotics be a bad idea? No, it's probably not a bad idea, um, but it's not going to prevent any of this. It's just going to prevent further infections. It's still going to cause massive pulmonary edema but it's not going to cure the uh, virus and um, it doesn't stop this process from happening. 
what they're looking for is something that is actually antiviral that will stop the virus. Um, and they're trying a bunch of different things, but it's working in some and not in others. And again, I think a lot of this is genetics and they don't know how a lot of this works. But this is basically the picture of what is happening in a COVID virus patient or in any uh, patient that gets ARDS. Membrane break is stiff first, causing decreased oxygenation, increased CO2, and then um, fluid starts rushing the space. And then you end up now having even more widespread decreased oxygenation and increased CO2 because now not only are your membranes damaged, but you now have fluid in all these alveoli. And the problem is it's not just happening in one alveoli, it's happening throughout your lungs. Um, so that is the picture that we're showing here on the sides of this x-ray is um, air is black and fluid is white. Someone asked me if you can tell the difference between blood and um, pulmonary fluid on an x-ray and no, you can't. Um, is the membrane damage perfect? permanent? Um, in some degrees, yes. It depends on how um, old you are, how good your system to build up. You may be able to repair some of the alveoli and not others. Um, it's kind of like a bomb going off in the lungs and the entire lung being damaged. It's going to take years to rebuild. Um, so yes, the membrane damage is somewhat permanent, but it is healable. I guess, does that make sense? And the longer a membrane stage is damaged, the longer, the harder it is to heal. So, I mean, imagine a city um, where you just um, put off an atomic bomb. Everything is damaged. And it takes years to put it together, and some things don't get ever put back together. And that is what your lungs look like kind of after ARDS. Yes, yeah, some things get put back together, but not everything. Some things stay damaged um, for the rest of your life. Um, and sometimes the damage is so uh, massive and you don't have cleanup crews and you can't fix the damage um, that you don't recover. So ARDS is, um, they're saying that even if you get through having COVID, there's a 20% long-term damage. Yes, I think that's because of the massive widespread damage that you do have um, from having the lung, from having this virus attack your lungs. And really those statistics are not much different um, for regular ARDS. Basically, this is a widespread ARDS that's happening. I mean, 20% um, damage after any kind of ARDS is a pretty standard, um, you know, if you have ARDS after you got septic, um, you have a 20% long-term damage as well. So the COVID virus isn't doing much different damage than what ARDS from any other source is doing. Um, but the problem is, is that this is much more common now than ARDS usually is in our population. Um, so this is a very timely lecture to have right here. You guys will have a lot more knowledge. But you can see how this um, is basically affecting all of our lungs here. So in this top chest x-ray, you're seeing what they'll call patchy whiteout. And this is where we are seeing tiny bits of fluid um, in every alveoli. So it's, it's patchy because we are seeing a picture of fluid-filled alveoli here. And you can see it, it, it takes the whole lungs. It's not just one lobe that has patchy um, alveoli, full, patchy pulmonary edema. This is the entire lung, is all the alveoli are being damaged throughout the entire lung, um, and you are filling with fluid. Um, in the bottom here, this patient at the end here probably is getting ventilated now, and we have pushed fluid out of some of the alveoli at the top of the lungs, but there is, you can see now at the bottom of the lungs there, there's no longer patchy, it's just completely fluid filled. Even the dead space around the alveoli is full of fluid. So um, that's kind of just a picture of what's going on here. This is ARDS, um, probably pre intubation, where we can't really oxygenate everything, what we're using the oxygen and the pressure of the ventilator for is to push some of that fluid out of the alveoli, and we're trying to recruit our alveoli to be working again. Um, so we've cleared the very teeny tiny top portion of one of the lungs there, but the rest of the lungs you can see is basically full of fluid. It's almost completely white. 
Um, so, sorry, I'm just reading the comment here. Damage is only for COVID with ARDS, otherwise no damage or asymptomatic. Um, so, basically, COVID with ARDS is going to have definitely scarring repercussions. You're, you're not going to recover. If you were asymptomatic, you may have damage to your lungs, but just a small enough part of your lungs that you never really had symptoms. Because remember, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of alveoli in there. If only a few of them get damaged, you're not going to have widespread symptoms because the rest of your lungs are oxygenating. Um, so it's hard to say. Probably that 20% long-term damage is probably a symptom, you know, probably something for ARDS. I'm not sure what we're looking at there. But you could have 20% of what you did get damaged never get repaired, but what you did get damaged is small enough that it's not really a big issue. Um, last semester, I got really, really, really sick. I guess some of you who maybe had me for clinical um, in Block 3, remember, I got, I got really sick with a flu, an actual flu, and had... Um, infiltrates or uh, basically these patchy spots in two lobes. And um, it took me months to feel better from that because just that, um, that flu that I got damaged just a few portions. I ended up with pneumonia afterwards, but did damage two lobes of my lungs. Um, I didn't end up in ARDS because it wasn't my entire lungs. But when you have any portion of your lung damaged, it takes a while to rebuild that. Um, you end up being short of breath for a while, um, have, being symptomatic for a while. So if you are asymptomatic, there probably wasn't much damage to your lungs. If you are symptomatic and you do have involvement of your lungs, that 20% is probably true. But if a small part of your lung was damaged versus a large part of your lungs, then that 20% is different. So um, anyway, that's kind of ARDS in a nutshell there. So we see them tachypnic and tachycardic as the first signs while the membrane is broken. Then as fluid starts to flood into all these alveoli, um, someone posts, is ARDS what was causing all the people with e-cigs to be hospitalized? Well, um, yes. So e-cigs are causing damage to the pleural membrane. Um, that they don't, and it's probably also genetic. Um, that whatever you inhale with the e-cigarette or the vape, um, your body doesn't like that and attacks what it's attached to. And if you inhale um, vape and it's in your alveoli and your body doesn't like it and wants to attack it, it's going to try to attack it through the membrane. Um, so those e-cigarettes, yes, depending on the chemical that's in there and how your body attacks those chemicals can cause damage to your lungs. So if your lung membranes are already damaged um, and then you get a virus on top of it that latches in there, you're much more prone to go into this ARD state. Um, so yeah, and surfactant is what keeps us the surfactant damage. Surfactant is the, the mucus on the inside of the alveoli that basically keep bacteria and stuff away from that oxygen exchanging membrane. It helps trap bacteria and you can cough it out. So if we have lost our first line of defense, which is their surfactant from the, the, the chemicals in the cigarettes, the surfactant or smokers. So if you are a smoker or a vapor, um, you're causing damage to the surfactant production, which is our first line of defense from keeping things away from that um, membrane where, thing, where the oxygen and CO2 is exchanged. Surfactant is our first line of defense. If that's gone, now the chemicals from the smoke or the cigarettes or um, a virus can get straight to the membrane because there's no surfactant and um, can cause mem membrane damage there. So that's why they're seeing now with COVID patients, the smokers and the vapors um, are just are, are more prone to getting this ARDS effect. Um, one, because there's no surfactant as your first line defense from something being inhaled. And um, two, there is um, already damage to, sorry, my mail keeps popping up on here. Um, there is damage to the actual membrane already that makes those first few cues. Um, if you are already living with those first two cues, then you're 
going to go straight into your worsening cues. Um, so basically what we're seeing here as, as, um, the lungs start filling with fluid, all the alveoli start filling with fluid, the alveoli start collapsing, the dead start starts filling with fluid. We start hearing, we start getting hypoxemia, which is low blood O2 that does not get better with oxygen. So what is happening to these COVID patients is you go in short of breath, you come in with tachypnea and tachycardia, right? You've got your first few signs going on there. You're coming in short of breath. You can't breathe. You're dyspnea. You're tachycardic. You're tachypnic. You've got that cough. You go into the ED. They take your chest x-ray, and it's starting to look patchy, starting to look bad. So they admit you. They put you on oxygen. Within, and this will happen not even just with COVID. This happens with flu patients. Every flu season, we see this happen with patients. We see patients coming in. Oh, I just can't catch my breath. I'm a little short of breath. And within 24 hours, they're on a ventilator because this is so widespread. Um, what happens is you put them on two liters nasal cannula. Their O2 doesn't go up. For those of you, if you remember to, um, I told you to remember this for the respiratory lecture, our um, little guy in Sim, the 17-year-old vapor, and I told you was going into ARDS, he was to keep Nick tachycardic, and you guys were all frustrated um, who took care of him because the, no matter what oxygen you gave him, it didn't help. And that is what is happening here. What oxygen you're giving them isn't helping because all the oxygen is meeting dead ends and is getting just exhaled back out. You can't get oxygen into your body. You can't get CO2 out of your body. So the hypoxemia, the low O2 in your blood, does not get better with oxygen. Your O2 stats stay low. So you go nasal cannula. You go um, face mask. You go 100% non-rebreather. You go BiPAP, CPAP. None of it helps because the oxygen that you are pushing in um, just meets a dead end and gets exhaled back out. Um, the only thing that does end up starting to help, and we'll talk about in the treatment, is pressurized oxygen, which we can deliver through CPAP, BiPAP, or ventilator. And that's because what will happen in the second screen there, in the second x-ray, is we can pressurize air in, which, hap which helps push fluid out of the lungs. And now we have a little bit of aerated lungs um, at the top, but you can see most of the lung are actually useless. Um, so hypoxemia that does not get better with oxygen or increased ventilator support. Um, coarse crackles and rails, that is what that second picture is going to be looking like. This patient sounds like a washing machine because they are full of fluid. Um, cyanosis because oxygen is not getting to the body. Intercostal retractions, that's accessory muscle use because the body is still saying, hey, breathe harder, breathe harder. The same way when you have an MI, the body asks the heart to work harder, even though it's dying. This the same thing is happening to the lungs here. They're like, hey, we're not getting oxygen. Um, come on, help us out. And it makes the lung try to breathe harder and harder and harder. Your lung muscles wear out, and you start using other chest muscles to help you breathe. Um, so that's symptoms. And this is another slide that kind of shows you symptoms. Um, what are we going to do to help them breathe? And I thought, I think we kind of talked about BiPAP or mechanical ventilation. Um, and this is not in the ARDS. I love this little monomic here. Um, it's not in order, but it is nice for the, the primary treatments of ARDS, antibiotics, respiratory support, diuretics, and um, prone. Prone is our last ditch effort. Um, but the medications, antibiotics, for all the reasons we talked about, you are very susceptible for secondary infections. Um, no matter how your ARDS got caused. So you do get antibiotics because you got pulmonary edema. You do get diuretics to help try and dry out your vascular system so that we can pull fluid from the lungs into the vascular system. We do want to try to clean out. And we, if we don't have good surfactant or anything, we will give meds that will help mobilize our secretions because getting secretions out will be a primary way to clear the lungs. Um, BiPAP or mechanical ventilation is usually the only way to aerate an ARDS patient by giving pressure, pressurized oxygen. We have to push air into the lungs rather than let it passively be inhaled into the lungs. We have to physically push air into the lungs. And really the only way we can push air into the lungs is with a BiPAP, 
a CPAP or mechanical ventilation. Um, so they usually have respiratory support. Um, so yes, is the fluid from the lungs being pushed back into the capillaries with ventilation and then that is being peed out with diuretics? Yes, exactly. That is what we are trying to do with ARDS. It's, it's basically trying to squeeze the lungs or put pressure on it. We are basically pressurizing because fluid is leaking into the alveoli because it's the path of least resistance. The, the capillaries are full, the alveoli are empty, so fluid leaks into them. If we can physically push air into the alveoli, we push it into the capillaries, and then hopefully um, the capillaries were dried out by the diuretics, and then it gets taken away. Um, like I said, it is a fight, and it is a continuous try, um, but that's the best way that we can get fluid out of the lungs, is um, diuretics and pressurized air. Um, Keep those secretions mobilized because the last thing we need on top of ARDS is a growing bacterial load. On top of our already load, our immune system will come in to fight it, which will cause more swelling. So keep those secretions out of there. And, um, and yes, we're getting to prone positioning. So we are keeping them mobilized. We are giving them medications. We're pressurizing their lungs. The prone position does not help us mobilize. Um, the prone position helps us fill the lungs with air. And I'm gonna try to draw a picture. It's probably not gonna be very good. Um, let me go to a whiteboard here. And I'm gonna show you the reason for proning the patient. Um, if we look at our lungs, they're kind of, oops, well, ignore that. Um, they're kind of triangle shaped. Um, when we sit them upright, what we're doing and what we do before we prone is we're trying to get the fluid down to the bases so we can aerate the tops of our lungs. But you can see the tops of our lungs aren't very big. What we want to do is we want to aerate the maximum amount of lungs. Um, if we looked at our lungs from the side, you would see that they kind of look like this because our heart is in the front. So they're very skinny at the top and they're actually pushed towards the back. Um, so when we are filling, sitting a patient upright, um, yes, and Jessica, you're right, we do still mobilize them when they're prone, um, if we can. But this is all we're aerating, is that teeny tiny little top of a Hershey's Kiss that we've got. That's really not enough air. When we prone a patient, we're laying them um, down. And if they're on their backside, let me show you what it looks like when they're on their backside. Um, you've got your lungs looking like a little Hershey kiss here. And you've got a heart sitting on top of them. So if you're laying flat on your back, um, the heart is pushing down on your lungs, making this space even smaller, okay? Your heart and all this blood flow that's going through your heart is starting to push on your lungs. And so this is all fluid filled and you're only aerating this teeny tiny bit of lung with our pressure. So when we prone the patient, um, there is much more space for your lungs. So let me clear it. Let me go here. So now we're going to prone our patient and we're going to draw our little Hershey's kiss. So we're putting our heart here and we've got our Hershey's kiss lungs here. Now the fluid drops from gravity, but we are oxygenating a much larger space. So we have removed the, the fluid, and this is all, this is your heart right here. Ah, let's go back. This is your heart and all of the blood flowing through the heart. That's some weight that's on those lungs here. So we want to basically expand the most part of our lungs. So when you're laying on your back, fluid will drop down and we can aerate the whole back side of the lungs, which is much larger of a space. So we can aerate more of the lung when you're on your back to the point when we sometimes flip the patients back onto their back um, when they're prone. So they're laying prone, they're laying um, belly down. All the weight of your intestines, your organs, your diaphragm, your heart is taken off of the lungs and you can aerate the entire backside of the lungs, which is much, much bigger. Um, and we can do a better job of oxygenating to the point that sometimes when we flip patients over onto their backs 
to um, do wound care or do whatever, they will code because they can't handle losing that amount of oxygen to the smaller space and they can't handle all that weight on the lungs and the fluid shifting throughout their lungs. Um, so prone patients, that is why prone is a last ditch effort for um, patients that we cannot ventilate normally. So we will put them on mechanical ventilation and if that mechanical ventilation is not pushing enough air into the lungs to get rid of fluid, then the only thing we have left to do is put them belly down, put them back up, and that way when the ventilator pushes air in, it goes to a larger part of the lungs. And we can get more alveoli involved in oxygenation, which then oxygenates the patient a little bit better. Um, prone position, when we do it in a rotoprone bed, let me see if I have a picture. So here's a picture of the two ways that we can prone a patient. Um, you can do the rotoprone bed there, which looks like a big, huge, fancy piece of equipment, but basically it's a whole bunch of pillows on their stomach area. We flip them down on their back, and then this bed does rotate back and forth. So we are mobilizing secretions as we um, as we are we're rocking them back and forth. Um, what they're doing with the COVID patients, because we don't have enough rotoprone beds um, available in the country is they're manually proning patients and we can't mobilize them as well. We can't rock them back and forth. Some ICU beds do rotate back and forth. Um, they do rock side to side um, and we will do rocking side to side to keep secretions moving because secretions that are stagnant, it's like a stagnant pond. It grows fungus, it grows bacteria, it grows crud. Whereas if you have an aerated pond, it doesn't grow as much. So we wanna aerate our lung pond that we've got going on. Um, so we will try to rock them as much as possible. We will do chest PT um, and then to get, because they can't cough, they're ventilated, we will suction. We will do chest PT. We put them um, uh, head, basically chest PT, you can bang on them, put them head down, try to get secretions to move up. Um, it's us and we are mobilizing their secretions and that is our job is to keep this lung as aerated as possible. So this is the prone position. You can do it via a bed or you can do it manually and um, we are definitely seeing a lot more manual proning out there in the um, ICUs now. Um, they were saying how they were manually proning people even at um, Chandler now. So um, this is what we're doing to manage ARDS, and COVID really is just a virus that causes ARDS. Tori, mute your phone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no problem. Sorry. Um, so that's the what we're doing. It's supportive. There really isn't anything we can do to go in there and pull that fluid out of the lungs. The best we can do is give them diuretics and give them positive pressure ventilation to try and um, pull, push that fluid out of there. And if we still cannot oxygenate them, we will prone them. Does that make sense to everybody and why we do the things we're doing with our ARDS patients? Um, so when you walk into an ICU, a COVID ICU, most of the patients will be on their belly. And that is why we are just trying to get maximize the amount of oxygen. Now, if you don't need that, if you can maintain your oxygenation sitting upright um, with a ventilator, then we won't go to prone because you can imagine the side effects of um, proning. It has a lot of good effects, but what can you imagine the side effects of proning a patient are? Since you're gonna see people with these side effects as we get out of this crisis. Um, yes, huge, huge risk of pressure ulcers, wounds, um, a lot of skin breakdown. Um, these rotoprone patients, now most of these patients, these are not well patients. Um, they are not only ARDS, but some of them are even septic from getting an opportunistic bacterial infection that now is growing in a leaky lung, lung membrane. So if you have bacteria in a leaky lung, lung or damaged lung membrane, it has a direct access to your bloodstream. So patients in ARDS very frequently become septic as well. And in sepsis, you have 
um, m lots of edema, um, lots of, um, we'll talk about sepsis, but a lot of these patients have a lot of facial edema and body edema already. And then when we put them in the prone position and we can't move them around as way we usually move them around, lots and lots of skin breakdown. Um, lots of facial swelling, a lot of swelling from just being in the prone position. These patients hanging upside down like this, all of their swelling is going to their um, the front of their body. Just like if you have a lot of swelling and you're laying on your back, you will have skin breakdown on your back. These patients will have skin breakdown on their front. Um, uh, I saw Nate said um, for disconnecting the vent. Um, yes, the vent could become disconnected no matter how you have your patient. But when they are prone and you don't have visual access on your um, ET tube as well, or you're actually rubbing your ET tube against a pillow when they're manually prone, um, there is much more risk. And then as you have facial swelling and facial breakdown, our way of holding the um, ET tube in is um, compromised. So yes, we do have um, much more risk of that breathing tube coming out because we can't secure it as well and um, we don't visualize it as well. Um, so there are many, many side effects for it. Again, I'm not going to test you on side effects of proning or anything. I just wanted to kind of discuss it as you're seeing it. Um, well, the testable stuff will probably be on this slide. These are what we're going to do to fix a patient with ARDS is do these interventions. Okay. The order is really going to be um, BiPAP. That's the one thing that's going to try to fix the problem the best. The meds go along with it. I mean, they're all, there's really no order. We do them all together. I probably wouldn't have you order them in order because I don't think that's fair. Um, we're doing um, all these things, meds, BiPAP, and mobilizing secretions all together. I'm not going to tell you. Um, but if you're trying to mobilize secretions when you really need oxygenation, um, you're kind of going, it's going to depend on your patient. A patient that needs oxygenation is going to go to ventilation. We're going to have to get them ventilated before we worry about their um, medications or their mobilizings of their secretions. So if we have a patient that has an O2 sat of 68 accessory muscle use and we need to um, get them on a breathing machine, that's going to come before any medications or mobilized secretions. we are um, got an airway breathing problem right now. We're going to do whatever it takes to fix that airway breathing problem. Um, so don't worry so much about ordering these. I would never ask you to order anything, um, but I want you to, if you have a patient in respiratory failure, you need to oxygenate them, ventilate them the best you can um, before worrying about getting meds on board or um, trying other things to get them to mobilize. We need to get them ventilated. Um, so... With these patients, since fluid is an issue, we wouldn't be using fluids to mobilize secretions, more manual methods. Correct. We're probably, if they already have so much fluid and they're leaking fluid, um, probably the, um, we want to keep them adequately hydrated, but we don't want to overload them with fluids. It'll just leak into their lungs. So that is correct, Blake. Um, if fluids, fluids are an issue here, we probably won't be uh, maintaining them with a ton of fluids. Um, they're probably going to go more to ventilation and probably more chest PT and um, positioning to mobilize secretions. All right. So that was ARDS. That was a membrane alveoli issue. Let's talk a little bit about, um, it's 1030. Um, do you want to take a five minute break or are you guys taking breaks as we go along? Do we need a break real quick? I can pause. No, I know. A couple people saying no, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, but it is recording. Take a break if you need it. Um, I'm going to get through effusions and then send you on a break to watch the chest tube demo. Um, normally I would demo it in class, but I'm not demoing in class. So I'm going to send you on a break to watch the chest tube demo. And then we will come back, um, answer questions about the chest tube demo and do respiratory failure. Um, so we're going to be talking about now, we talked about um, fluid in the alveoli and pleural membrane. That was our ARDS. Now we're talking about fluid outside the alveoli, okay, on the other side of that capillary membrane in the pleural space where we're only supposed to have a little bit of lubrication. Um, now we have fluid in the pleural space. 
You couldn't open the quizzes that we did the other day. Okay, I can look at that, Tori, while we're on a break, while you guys are watching the chest tube demo. Um, so fluid in the plural space is going to be um, basically fluid instead of just the um, lubricant. We now have a ton of fluid. It's called an effusion. So if you have a plural effusion that is not pulmonary edema, you can have an effusion and pulmonary edema. But if they're talking about an effusion, they're talking about fluid on the outside of the alveoli in the plural space. Um, an empyema, which is a great name, is a plural effusion that contains pus and infection. Um, remember how I showed you your little capillary membrane? Um, let me redraw the capillary membrane on here. So we have our alveoli and we have our capillary running right in front of our alveoli. So this is our blood-filled alveoli, I mean our blood-filled capillary. If you have an infection, um, white blood cells are going to want to exit the capillary there to clear up the infection. But when the capillary leaks, you can also leak to the other side, which will give you the effusion. So most pulmonary infections have a small degree of effusion to them as well, because when you open a capillary membrane to let white blood cells out um, and let infection clearing things out, um, it will leak on both sides. So when you have a lung infection, like a pneumonia, TB, um, chest trauma, where there's a lot of damage to the actual lung membrane, um, we're letting an inf the, the repair team out. And the capillary will leak to allow white blood cells and repair cells out. And that will cause an effusion as well as some pulmonary edema. Um, and so they usually go hand in hand. So when a patient has pneumonia, you'll see on x-ray, they have um, a pleural effusion. Nobody, that's an expected finding, um, but what we don't expect is that it starts to affect our breathing. Um, the, we don't really know what's in it. We can't look at x-ray um, to tell what kind of fluid it is. Someone said, can you tell the difference between blood and um, pleural effusion is just inflammatory no, you can't tell whether it's fluid or whether it's blood on an x-ray um, or a CT scan, um, but you have to sample it. But if you have a pneumonia, they're not going to go in and sample your pleural fluid. They know that um, you, have, you have an infection process. It's probably, um, sorry, my daughter's texting me. I'm trying to avoid her. Um, what is pleurisy? That's a good infection. That's just the um, having pleural effusions. So if you end up with multiple pleural effusions in your life and you get a lot of lung infections and you have a lot of pleural effusions, they call it pleurisy. Um, it's just the effect of having a lot of pleural effusions. Most pleural effusions are not treated. They're just allowed to go away. When I had my pneumonia, I had bilateral infiltrates, which was um, effusions and um, pulmonary edema in those lungs that were involved. Didn't have any treatment, never got hospitalized. It went away with time. Most effusions are treated that way. Um, when they do get treated is when they're causing problems with your breathing. Um, so here are a couple of x-rays of effusions here. Um, what they look like is you can see on this x-ray on the left here, um, this part, let me draw, get my little drawing out. Um, this right here, this is your heart. That's not any effusion or anything. That's actually your heart. Um, so this right here, we just ignore that because we want you to have a heart. This right here is the effusion. You can kind of see the, um, the long here, you can see the patchy parts of it. I don't know if you can blow this up on your computer or not. This right here is um, long and this, the rest of this is all fluid around it. Um, this right here, let's see, let's draw your heart silhouette here. This is your heart. This right here are effusions. Do you see how they look like little, um, let me clear them out again. Do you see how they look like, oh, those are the ends of boobs. 
but they're really not. They are um, collections of fluid at the base of the lungs, and they are super white because the the more fluid there is, the whiter it is. So this right here um, is like developing. I don't even know if I would call that an effusion other than the fact that this all in here looks a little off kilter. Um, so that I might call an effusion. This is definitely an effusion, these little guys right here. That's a collection of fluid. This is um, all this spider webby stuff is um, patchy uh, pulmonary edema. So the reason it looks spider webby is because it's in alveoli and it's in, um, this is pulmonary edema. It's in the capillaries, it's in the alveoli. There's swelling in here, there's a little bit more fluid. So this is patchy pulmonary edema and those bright white spots are the effusions. Again, I'm not gonna have you double check them. Um, I'm not gonna have you read them on x-ray for exams. You're not reading just x-rays, but I just wanted you to be able to see um, what they looked like. Um, so let's keep scrolling through. Um, so fluid in there is called an effusion. Air in the plural space is called a pneumothorax. Um, so there, it's still an effusion. It's an effusion of air. Um, so everything in the plural space um, could be called an effusion, but basically we call fluid in the plural space effusions. We call air in the plural space a pneumothorax. Um, what has happened here is the lung or one of those alveoli has been damaged to the point. Oops. Ah, no, go back. Go back. I was trying to draw, not go forward. Go back. Go back. Um, let me draw in here. What is happening here is let's just say this, um, this part of the lung blew a hole, uh, damage to the alveoli can draw, can blow a little hole. And now every time you take a breath in, air is entering the pleural space. And every time you exhale, air can't leave because that little hole kind of, you know, opens and closes a little bit. When you breathe in, you increase the pressure in your lungs and air can escape into the pleural space. Then when you exhale, um, that lung, little floppy lung hair, ho hole closes up and air stays in there. Um, so that pneumo, that air is just collecting all around the pleural space with each time that you breathe in. Um, the pneumothorax will exist the whole time that that little hole exists. Um, if your body can seal up that hole quickly with maybe some surfactant and a, and a plug, then the pneumothorax is self-limiting and you won't have any more. And eventually the air will dissipate, not treatable. Um, again, when you have a bigger hole that puts a lot of air into the space and then it doesn't escape, that air can build and build and build and build and basically make the lung smaller and smaller and smaller reducing the amount of um, exchangeable oxygen space because the lung is physically being squished. Um, so uh, pneumothoraxes um, may or may not be treated depending on your signs and symptoms. Um, if it is a small one that is self-limiting, they will let the air just dissipate and go away. If um, it is a large one that is causing um, issues, then they will treat it. Um, the most common cause is just damaged lung uh, tissue. If you have an actual injury to your chest, you can get damaged lungs, poke holes in them. Um, lung disease can also cause um, holes in the alveoli. Again, those damaged capillaries and um, alveoli membrane uh, can cause pneumothoraxes. So any questions on that before we move on to the treatment of all of these things? I see somebody typing. Oh. We'll let people type for a minute. Um, would we be able to differentiate lung visuals on a lactating mom? Um, hmm. I'm thinking that a lactating mom would look more like the patchy infiltrates that are going on here because you have fluid-filled ducts. Um, I think they would probably go to maybe more of a CT scan if that is an issue, if, um, 
if a lactating mom is showing um, issues like that, that we can't see the lungs through the fluid and gorge breasts, then they would probably go to a CT scan to look at them. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to be more superficial. It's going to be more solid tissue. It will be a little harder to see through them to get a good chest x-ray. Um, so yeah, we can go off of um, symptoms and stuff, but they probably would do a CT more on um, someone like that if we couldn't get a good visual. Um, let's just finish going through our definitions. So we have pneumothorax is air in the lung space. These are some x-rays of um, the air in the lung space. Very, very hard to see. Very easy to see this large pneumothorax. Do you see how this white, that's all air with no blood vessels around it um, at all? Um, most of these, we can kind of see a little bit of um, blood vessels normally in a lung. We can see the capillaries all around the lungs. You can see them kind of, um, you can see the fluid-filled capillaries. There, there's a little bit of patchy going on um, next to the heart there in that top one. Um, but you can usually see some thin spider webby things. Those are the capillaries of the lungs. Um, but you notice on this right side one, it kind of has a big arrow to the pneumothorax. And then you can see the pleural white line. That's the pleural membrane. You can kind of see the size of the lung and how far this has pushed in on the um, lung. On the bottom one here, um, there's no lung on this side at all. It is all pushed over. Your heart silhouette, which on this one... Um, this is your heart silhouette on this one. And then these little spidery things are capillaries. And then I'm just gonna outline here so that you can see this pleural white line. That's the pleural white line. So that's the end of your lung. The rest of that is all just air, empty dead air space that's not being oxygenated. Here, this is the end of your lung. And here is your heart silhouette kind of over here. That's your heart. Look how far over the heart got pushed. Everything got pushed out of place by this large, large pneumothorax here. Um, you've got everything pushed over to that side. So you can imagine that the bottom one is very symptomatic. And the top one may have shortness of breath, dyspnea. Um, but the, la the bottom one's going to have a lot more um, side effects. Yeah, you can see the tracheal DV. You can see the ET tube um, on this x-ray. And again, I'm not testing you on this. I just think it's interesting. This um, right here is the ET tube. And you can see how it's kind of making a turn here. Um, that whole trachea has been pushed over to the side. Um, your heart has been pushed over to the side, meaning your blood return and your aorta has all been pushed over to the side as well. So we have a lot of issues with blood flow. Um, with large pneumothoraxes. So I do like those pictures just for um, when we go through the side, signs and symptoms, you'll be able to um, see that a little better. Um, pleural space can also have blood in it. Um, if we actually pop one of those capillaries or an artery, um, then you can bleed into the pleural cavity and it's called a hemothorax. So really all I want you to know for the test is that effusions are fluid in the pleural space. Um, of inflammatory fluid, not blood, but inflammatory fluid, basically. You know, the same stuff that if you poke a, um, a blister, it comes out clear, straw-colored, that's inflammatory fluid. That's what an effusion has in it, is that yellowy, straw-colored inflammatory fluid. Um, a pneumothorax is air, and a hemothorax is blood. Um, the treatment for all of them are exactly the same and the cues for all of them are exactly the same. It doesn't matter what kind of fluid or air you have in the pleural space. The symptoms of having something in your pleural space are all exactly the same. Pleuritic chest pain, meaning the pain is worse with inspiration because that's when you're pushing up against that fluid or that air or that blood and it is causing pain on the lung. And the more it rubs against that fluid, because we remember blood is an irritant. Blood is a giant irritant outside of its vessel. Um, it irritates and stimulates um, pain cues. Um, air 
is going to be an irritant because it's not lubricated, it's dry. It's going to cause the lung to hurt when it pushes up against it. And um, the pleural effusion, the pleural, um, that inflammatory fluid is going to cause um, pain as you push up against it. So worse with inspiration, when your lung is at its biggest, that chest pain is called pleuritic. So when the pain is worse with inspiration, it is called pleuritic. Um, breast sounds will be diminished or absent in the affected lobes. So you don't hear crackles. You don't hear rails. There's no <clears throat> air bubbling through this fluid. The fluid's on the outside of the alveoli. <clears throat> so the sounds don't transmit through the fluid. So if you have an effusion or a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, when you're listening <clears throat> to that area that has it, you don't hear anything. Um, you can have shortness of breath because your lung is being squished some way. Um, depending on the, the degree of shortness of breath and dyspnea is going to depend on the size of the pneumothorax, hemothorax, or effusion. Small um, pneumothoraxes, hemothoraxes, and effusions may cause just dyspnea on exertion and pleural chest pain with a deep, deep breath on exertion. Larger ones will cause shortness of breath at rest um, or shortness of breath um, with activity. They basically get worse and worse the larger the effusion hemothorax or pneumothorax is. You will have tachypnea that will worsen with the size as well. So the existing cues get worse and worse with the bigger and bigger infection. And you see worsening cues with larger effusions, pneumos, and um, hemothoraxes. So just because you have pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath does not mean you're going to die of whatever you have. Um, and they will monitor your symptoms. And if you are trending towards worsening, they will do treatments for them. Um, most of the time, though, for small ones, we let the lung heal itself and let the body take care of the extra fluid. But if it is too large and causing worsening cues, then we will do um, the treatment, which is a chest tube. Um, Asymmetrical um, chest expansion is basically where this is pushing, like on that other x-ray, pushing so far over that um, you only have one side of your chest inhaling and exhaling because the other side of your chest is useless. It's full of air, blood, or fluid. Accessory muscle use because you're trying to oxygenate your body. Decreased blood pressure and tachycardia. That... Um, Tachycardia and decreased blood pressure is coming from the heart getting displaced. As the heart gets displaced, it has a harder time pumping and it starts to cause decreased blood pressure and tachycardia. So if you're having blood pressure drops and tachycardia, we're starting to really have a big pneumo, hemo, or effusion because it's starting to affect the heart and it's starting to push the heart out of um, place. Um, hypoxemia and hypercapnia again, will get worse and worse and worse the larger the infection is, or the pneumo, hemo, or effusion is. So there are a couple of things we can do. So yes, basically supportive care unless it is starting to cause problems because our treatments for it are very invasive and they don't want to do invasive procedures unless we really, really need them. So all our treatments are in our supportive until we need to do something invasive. And we will do something invasive when we start getting worsening cues. So our treatments are going to be mobilize um, fluid. Can this cause atelectasis? Well, yes, um, let's look back at that x-ray here. Um, all the lung tissue that has been crushed um, is now atelectic. Um, can it cause atelectasis? Yes, atelectasis just means that um, you have areas of alveoli that are not, um, that are squished. So yes, this does cause atelectasis. Um, atelectasis is also just when you don't take deep enough breaths and part of your alveoli collapse from misuse. Um, but atelectasis just means collapsed alveoli. And so yes, when this lung re-expands, those alveoli are collapsed. Um, so I'm going to have to see if I can, I might have to bring out my pig lungs here. Um, Let's talk about the interventions. Um, our non-invasive interventions, or what can we do, supportive care, are going to be increasing oxygenation um, and doing mobilizing secretions and chest PT. Can we reinflate alveoli? Yes, we can. And we, um, 
Gosh, I would have thought you had done atelectasis um, ahead of time, but that's what the incentive spirometer does. You reinflate alveoli. The way I explain it to my, um, so let's go back to a picture of a crushed lung here. Um, when this lung re-expands, when we finally remove whatever air, fluid, or um, thing, and that lung re-expands, all those little alveoli have been crushed and have collapsed. How do we reinflate post-surgery? When you have surgery and you go on a ventilator for surgery, um, they don't ventilate your entire lungs. They only ventilate enough to oxygenate you. And you end up with atelectasis because um, during anesthesia, the bottom parts of your lungs don't get oxygenated and they collapse. Um, so how do you reinflate your alveoli after surgery? Anyone? You've probably been doing it. It's a common intervention that we do all the time for people that have trouble breathing. Yes, the incentive spirometer. Um, so that is one of our cues. The other way we can do it is positive ventilation. Um, but what you're doing and what I explained to my patients after cardiac surgery is those alveoli have collapsed. The only way to get them to blow up again is to stretch them and then blow air into them, just like a balloon. So if you have a little water balloon that you're trying to get air into, you know it's really hard to push air into them. You have to stretch them and stretch them and stretch them and then push air into them and stretch them and stretch them and stretch them and push air into them. And once you get a first good flush of air into them, then they blow up beautifully. And alveoli is just like a balloon. You just need to get a little bit of air into them and then they puff right up. Um, so how do we get air into them? We have to stretch them. We stretch them with incentive spirometer. We stretch them with coughing and deep breathing. We stretch them by getting up and walking around because that stimulates deep breathing and exercise. Any exercise, anything that will stimulate you, taking a bigger, deeper breath is going to give that little puff of air to the alveoli and then let them inflate all the way. So yes, atelectasis is treated um, very easily by increased deep breathing, increased coughing, um, increased incentive spirometer. We can clear up atelectasis with those things. The reason um, patients don't like to do it is because it hurts. When you're trying to puff into that balloon when you first stretched it, it kind of hurts a little bit, right? It's, it, it takes some effort. And um, patients, when they're in pain, don't want to put forth the effort to pop open their alveoli. That first breath, that first breath into the balloon takes effort, but it's worth it because once that balloon has started getting air into it, then the next few breaths are very easy. Um, so you run against resistance in the patient not wanting to do incentive spirometer, not wanting to do coughing and deep breathing. It hurts. Yeah, it's effort, um, but we need to have them do it. So yes, um, all these pleural space diseases can cause atelectasis, and as, we, as they're healing from them and re-expanding their lungs, they will need to do incentive spirometer, cough, deep breathing to help combat that atelectasis. Um, but while you have an effusion, um, like I said, they're going to monitor it. If it's getting larger, they'll do x-rays. They'll keep an eye on it, and you're going to keep an eye on your symptoms. If you're having worsening cues or a enlarging effusion pneumo or hemothorax, then we will do interventions. And our interventions are, um, the first thing we can do, it's a one-time procedure, is a thoracentesis, where they'll go in and we're aiming for the bee needle there on the picture. Can you tell on x-ray if there's blood or fluid? No, you cannot. It all looks white. Um, no way to tell. So if they don't know if it's blood or fluid, they may do this thoracentesis to test the fluid to see what it is. Sometimes they pull pleural fluid out to test it for um, infection, they'll test it for blood, they'll test it for, but we don't wanna stick a needle into the lung space unless we have to. Um, if you've had chest trauma, um, they will probably assume that it is a, a pneumo or a hemothorax. You can tell the difference there. If it's chest trauma where you have a broken rib, and it looks like air, it's a pneumothorax. If it's a chest trauma with a broken rib and it looks like fluid, well, you don't have an infection. It's probably blood. Um, so they're kind of going to go based on your presenting history, and they're not going to just needle you to see what it is if they can figure it out. If you have pneumonia, it's probably a infectious, it's probably an effusion. Um, and they won't needle it to see. They're just going to assume. 
Um, but if they do needle it, it's called a thoracentesis. Anytime you put a needle into something, it's a centesis. And here it's going into the thoracic space, so it's a thoracentesis. The doc is aiming for a B needle there, but you can see our post procedure care. You are at very risk of puncturing the lung or puncturing the liver if you go in the wrong space. Um, and so that's what we're looking for post thoracentesis. Um, we don't do the thoracentesis, a physician or a practitioner will do it. Um, and if they do it and drain fluid out, you have to watch afterwards for the side effects, which could be, oops, we accidentally, um, my slides aren't chaining on the screen. I, it should show thoracentesis on the screen. If it does not, it might be that your Wi-Fi is having um, a hard time. Yeah, refresh your screen. Maybe your Wi-Fi hasn't um, caught up with it yet. Um, if not, don't worry, it is recording with the proper slides because I can see my recording as I'm doing it. Um, the proper slides are here. Um, so um, if we puncture the lung with the needle, what do you think you're going to see? In addition to pleural fluid that you drained out, what will you now have? Possibly blood and possibly um, air. Because if you puncture the lungs, yes, you're going to have air in that space now and possibly blood in that space. So if you did a thoracentesis and you're listening to lung sounds, what would be a disturbing lung sound to hear post-thoracentesis? Absent. Exactly. Absent lung sounds over the affected space is going to give, that's what we're going to hear if we have an effusion. Remember, effusions give you, um, effusions, pneumo, and hemos give you absent lung sounds over that, over that lobe. You won't hear wheezing because we haven't touched the airways. The airways are all still open. We've punctured through the alveoli. We haven't punctured through the actual bronchi and bronchioles, which is what wheezing is from. Um, we won't hear friction rub because we'll hear that around the heart. Friction rubs are heard around the heart. Um, we don't really hear them that well in the plural space. What we hear, and you won't hear crackles because we're not hearing, well, yeah, you won't hear crackles because when you put your lung over, so let's say that we um, are listening to, that's the right lower lobe where we have our little needle picture here. They're puncturing the right lower lobe there. Well, on that little lady, she's leaning over. That's the left lobe. So let's say we have done a thoracentesis of the left lower lobe. But now we have accidentally punctured the lung. Um, when you listen to that left lower lobe, you're not going to hear anything because um, you are getting air in there, which is not exchanging air. When we hear crackles, we are hearing oxygen coming in through the alveoli. We're not hearing the alveoli anymore. The alveoli are being pushed further and further away from our stethoscope, and we are hearing what's in front of our stethoscope, which is just dead air. Air is leaving the lung into the pleural space. Yes, air is leaving the lung into the pleural space, but it doesn't cause that you're not, the bubbling sound is getting further and further and further away. Um, air is leaving into the pleural space, um, but it depends on how much fluid was there and how much bubbling. You really don't hear crackles. You hear absent breath sounds. And that's what we are. The lung is actually getting further and further away from you. Um, and if they drained out fluid and now it's just air going into that space, you don't hear the, fss, you don't hear, um, the leak, basically. You don't hear the leak as crackles and you don't hear the leak. You're just hearing dead sound. You're hearing nothing. So when you have a hemo, pneumo, um, or a fusion, when you listen over the lobe that's affected, you hear nothing. You hear no inhale in. You no hear inhale out. You hear no, it just sounds nothing. Um, that's the sound of something not right in that space. We're supposed to hear air exchanging, and we're not hearing air exchanging. So if you're listening to your lung sounds post thoracentesis and you had maybe crackles in that space before and now you don't, that is a change in your lung sounds. Um, so 
you're going to be listening post-procedure for your lung sounds. Um, you want to avoid them coughing because that could, if they did have a teeny tiny hole that did get plugged up right away, um, a cough could open that hole um, in the lung. Um, liver would be bleeding, which would lead to, so bleeding of the lung or bleeding of the liver is going to lead to a large hemothorax in that area. Um, air escaping the lung is going to lead to a pneumothorax in that area, um, all of which will give you absent breast sounds. So post thoracentesis, we want to hear an improvement of your breast sounds. If they were pulling out pleural fluid, because look at this lady at the top picture, she's got a ton of fluid, you were probably hearing absent breast sounds before the thoracentesis, right? Because she had a fusion there. So you should hear after a thoracentesis, and they've removed that fluid, you should hear that lung expanding into there. You should start hearing some air exchange in that left lower lobe. But if you are still hearing absent breast sounds in the left lower lobe, there might be something going on. We need to get an x-ray to double check. Um, so post needle in the pleural space, hopefully we just pull out pleural fluid and the lung re-expands and we start to hear breast sounds in that space after the thoracentesis. Um, any continued absent breast sounds would probably be something that you would want to report to the physician because they did not remove all the pleural fluid or it's being replaced by blood or more or more or air. So we would want to double check on that. Um, and then of course you want to make sure when we position them, do we need a CT to confirm the x-ray? Um, no, x-rays should be perfectly fine and CT is if they want more information um, beyond the x-ray or they couldn't see what they wanted on the x-ray. Um, so if you ask, uh, if you tell the physician, hey, you did a thoracentesis, um, there were absent breast sounds prior to, and I'm not hearing the lung re-expand, there's still absent breast sounds, they may want to get a chest x-ray post thoracentesis to figure out what's going on. And then if they can't see what they want on the chest x-ray, then they will go to the CT scan. Um, but usually an x-ray is sufficient to see if there's something in that area. Um, position them on their unaffected side. So don't put them down onto the side that just had the needle biopsy. You want to let that lung expand after a thoracentesis. So you want to position them on their unaffected side with their damaged lung upright so that that lung can expand. Okay? Does that make sense? Fluid will drain away from that lung and the lung will have a chance to expand. So position them on the unaffected side for an hour so the damaged lung can have a chance to expand. We don't want to put weight on the lung. It makes it hard to expand. So we want them laying. So on this lady that we did a puncture on the left lower lobe, we would want her laying on her right side after the procedure so that that left lung could expand a little bit. And we'll monitor for bleeding, and our complication is pneumothorax, hemothorax, which sounds like continued absent breast sounds post thoracentesis. Any other questions? Thoracentesis? Once, twice, moving on. Um, let's talk about our other doing. Okay, so let's talk now about the more long term uh, way to drain out um, effusions and pneumos and hemos, which is a chest tube. This is a Foley for the um, chest space, is a chest tube. Um, I do have a demo of the chest tubes because what I am going to test you on is going to be how to monitor these chest tube drainage and let you know whether they're working or not, and that is on the demo. So what this is, is the thoracentesis was just a needle where we pulled out fluid and then you take the needle out. It's a good for a one-time thing. But if this is a large um, effusion, hemo or pneumo, that is going to take some time um, to heal or to get all that fluid out, and it will just refill again. So if you have a pneumothorax and we pull the air out, um, it's just going to refill. The lung space is going to refill with air again until the body can heal the hole in the lung. So a chest tube can go in 
um, for any reason, um, for any effusion, hemo, or pneumothorax, and it will drain air, um, fluid, or blood um, until it's not needed anymore. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we know if it's not needed anymore, but the picture there is showing the actual chest tube, and I do show you in the demo what a chest tube looks like. It looks like a thin um, silicone tube. Um, it's got holes in the end of it, and um, the physician will put them in to the correct place, but we are in charge of connecting them and monitoring the drainage system. We set up the drainage system, we help the physician connect the drainage system, and then we maintain the drainage system. So I will tell you a little bit about the drainage system on my demo. Um, if it's going to be air, if it's a pneumothorax, they insert the chest tube kind of high up because air will rise. You're probably going to have your patient sitting upright and air will rise. So we want to have the drain up high to pull the air out. If um, it is a pneumo or, I mean, sorry, a hemothorax or an effusion, they will put the drains uh, lower in the lung because when you're sitting upright to oxygenate, fluid will drop to the bottom and that's where it's most easily drained. Um, post any surgery that involves the thoracic space, they will have chest tubes as your wound drainage system. Um, if you have heart surgery or lung surgery and you're going to have drainage around that system, you know you're going to get an effusion after surgery because there's tons of leftover blood and there's healing process going on. So you are going to have effusions after any kind of surgery in your chest space. So they will put these in as the um, wound care drainage system. So chest tubes are used for any number of reasons. And um, I've had cardiac surgeons tell me, heck yeah, I poke the lungs. I poke the lungs all the time during heart surgery. They're always in the way. And so they assume that this patient's going to have a pneumothorax after heart surgery. So we have the treatment already in place. So you will see people after and after lung surgery, Heck yeah, you poke the lungs, you just cut it open. You're going to have a pneumothorax. So they have the chest tubes in as the intervention because they know it's going to happen. So um, a chest tube is the way that we drain air around, drain air, blood, and fluid around the pleural space. So that's the chest tube. It's the ultimate intervention, but it's very invasive. Um, and it will sit in there for as long as we need it. Just like a JP drain will sit in a wound as long as it's draining, uh, we will have a chest tube in the site as long as we need it. Um, we're going to get into the chest tube drain system is not just, you know, an empty Foley. There's two other parts to it. Um, there is a suction control chamber because we generally want to pull stuff out of the chest cavity, whether it being air, blood, or um, fluid. Not all of it will just drain to gravity. We may want to put suction on it to help pull that stuff out. So the doctor will, describe, um, will prescribe an amount of suction, but we're not going to connect just this drain straight to the wall suction because it's going to be very low suction. We don't want to damage the lung tissue. We've already got damaged lung tissue or an in trouble lung. We don't want to damage it with... Um, accidentally putting it at 40 or 80 suction when that could damage the lung tissue. The lung tissue can really only take up to 40 millimeters of suction. And we all know that wall suctions are very not specific suction. Um, and we don't want to be trying to get between 10 and 20 millimeters of suction on a wall um, suction thing. So the suction drainage, the chest tube drainage units have an embedded suction control chamber that will make sure that the suction going to the lung is um, the proper amount of suction and not too much to damage. There is another chamber called the water seal chamber. So every single suction container, no matter how they look, has a suction control chamber, a water seal chamber, because we've just basically put something into the chest wall. We have put a tube in there. Um, if air gets in, as you take a nice big deep breath in, if air gets in, it will make a pneumothorax worse. It will add a pneumothorax to a hemothorax. So we have to basically make sure that this, this um, tube is sealed off from the outside air. Um, do we need CT to confirm the x-ray? Kay, you just want to give everybody a CT scan. 
Uh, sorry, you're reading. I thought you rewrote that. I, I'm sorry. Uh, that's an old question. Never mind. Ignore that. I thought I saw something pop up and then I thought that was a new question. Sorry, ignore me. Um, uh, the water seal chamber is there to keep air from our outside environment from getting into the lungs. Um, so the water seal chamber always has to be filled in um, a chest tube. That is what is keeping air from outside the lung from getting into the lung. Air can leave through water, but air can't get in through water. You can't suck in air through water. Um, so uh, I will show you again in the demo. I do a live demo of actually turning on suction and showing you what it looks like. And then we have drainage chambers on them. So in this atrium picture right here, um, the A channel is the suction control chamber, the B channel is the water seal chamber, and the D uh, and the C is B and C are water seal, and D is the drainage chamber. Um, I'm going to show you on the demo, and I'm going to tell you a little bit. Um, I'm going to let you watch the demo first before we go through the rest of the slides because I think you need to see this in action to understand it working. Um, the one thing I'm going to tell you about a water seal, I'm going to go back to this picture here um, just so I can show you why we use a water seal. Yes, it's going to be on my YouTube channel. I'll give you the link in the chat in just a second. Um, if we poke it, so let's take that, let's pretend in that B needle there of that picture, if you can see the picture. Let's pretend we just put a needle into the pleural space without a syringe on it. What would happen to the patient? as they breathe in and out. You would breathe air in from the outside to the plural and drag it into the plural space, right? Air would get in. Air would come out of the needle when you inhaled because the lung would get big and it would push air out of the needle when you inhaled. But when you exhale and the lung gets small, guess what you would suck in to the plural space. You would suck in air. So you would, you would yes, you would expel, expel air on inhalation, but you would suck in air when you exhaled the lung, when the lung got smaller. So in order to prevent that air sucking into the chest, we have to put, like that needle is showing, has fluid in it. If you put fluid in that syringe on the end of the needle, now when you exhale, air will leave the chest and bubble out through the fluid. But when you inhale, it creates a barrier so air can't get into the chest. That is a water seal. So water will allow air to leave but it does not allow air to go back in. Thank you, Blake, you explained it beautifully there. So um, when you exhale, water will not suck in, I mean, water will keep air from sucking into the chest, but it will allow as you inhale, it will allow as the pressure increases, air will be allowed to leave, but then the water keeps air from sucking back in. So I like showing it as the needle there, and in class, I do try to show you with an actual needle. Um, but what the chest tube is doing here is imagine that water seal chamber, that C chamber, that is your syringe on the end of the needle. So when your patient has an, if they have a pneumo here, when they inhale, you will see water, I mean, you will see air leaving the chest you will see bubbling in that water seal chamber. That is the patient's air leaving their chest. When they inhale though, they won't be able to get any air from the outside into their chest. The water seal there is the, the barrier from, water, from air from the exhale being sucked into the chest. So what I'm gonna do is let you go and watch um, the video. So yes, I will show you the filling of those chambers um, and what we're doing. So I'm going to send you off on a break and a lunch. Um, you may grab a lunch and then um, YouTube. Um, 
this is the link to YouTube. You can get it off of anywhere, um, anywhere in the modules. Um, it is, um, what is it, case sensitive. So it does have to have a capital P and a capital G. Um, otherwise, you can, I don't know, you copy paste it into your browser. Um, go watch the chest tube demo. It's a half an hour. So um, I'm going to pause on the recording here for everything.